Okay, it's time to start, I think. Uh, welcome to Gen Dispatch. Uh, just a little introduction, as this session is uh, totally virtual. Uh, this session is being recorded, and make sure, please, that your video is off, even if your camera is covered. Um, mute your microphone unless you're speaking, and use the WebEx chat only to join the mic queue. So for any other conversation you might want to have, there is the jabber. Um, the blue sheet in this is, is in the Etherpad, which I have um, linked both in the WebEx chat and the Jabber. Um, it helps if you state your name before speaking, even if you will be introduced by the queue manager, who is me in this case. And if you can't speak, feel free to use the Jabber um, and preface your comment with Mike, and it will be reported via audio. We are also monitoring the Jabber chat. So if you use plus one in the Jabber chat, please make sure to write what you are plus one for so that we can keep track of what's your opinion. And let's also try to keep uh, most important comments and conversation and discussion um, at the mic so that the presenter also doesn't miss what's being said in the Jabber. So let's try to have one conversation but it's fine if you also ask questions or clarification that you don't think are important enough to report to the audio in the Jabber chat. Um, to make management easier, I wanted to ask you to try to keep the question to the end of the session or the presentation, um, uh, but you can always bring up clarification questions if you think are um, important to have at any time. Um, I think I covered everything I wanted to say. Please do find the blue sheet again. They're at, at the end of the Etherpad. And we have a minute taker. Thank you, Rich. And the Jabber's cry. Thank you, Bron. So, Pete. All right. A reminder, even though we are halfway through the week, that one should note well, this is an ITF session, virtual or otherwise. So. All of the IETF participation rules apply. If you are not aware of these, please make yourself aware before you start participating in the working group by saying anything or typing anything into the uh, Jabber room or otherwise. Uh, in particular, know that there are uh, things about code of conduct and anti-harassment and in particular, uh, patents and copyrights and things, all sorts of intellectual property rules. So please check those out if you have not already. Uh, so we are doing Gen Dispatch today. Um, just to point out, these should all now be pasted into the Jabber chat. Um, if anybody needs those, please let us know in the Jabber chat. We can repaste them. And they are also available on the Meeting Materials website. So here is our agenda. We are open for bashing. Basically, other than what uh, Francesca and I have been mumbling about, uh, Miria is going to present on the update tag. Brian and or Stephen uh, may be presenting on the eligibility issues. And then we're going to have open mic. Anybody have any additions or changes to the agenda that they would like to bring up? Yay, moving right along. Uh, the next presentation will be Maria's. Uh, let me find the right one. Uh, new tags, new tags, yay. And let me just go to slideshow if I can. Where did slideshow go? Ah, because the other one is not done with its slideshow. Sorry about but, that. Let me go. Command F should do it as well, I think. No. Uh, Maybe you didn't click on the winner. No, we gotta on we've got oh, okay. to stop the slideshow from this. Come along, no. How do we end the slideshow? 
You go to the bottom and we get the tools. You know what? I just stopped talking anyway. Stop <laughs> talking and I'll get to this. Okay. Yes. So I'm Mia Kulivind. Um So the drug we are talking about is uh, Sorish and I wrote them together. And uh, the reason why we came up with this is because um, the, there are many, many discussions over and over again over the years in the IHG and with the authors about what the uptake, update tech in a um, draft means if it should be used or not or whatever. The backstory here is that the ISG um, is aware of this problem and so um, they also tried or proposed an ISG statement which basically said, sorry, but update is not well defined. So just to make you all aware of that, um, we sent this uh, proposed ISG statement to um, the mailing list and we got a lot of feedback that that's not helpful and we would rather like to have a clear definition of the update tech. Um, so just to little recap what the uptake text does currently. So it's a, it's a tag, you can, it's still the slide, <laughs> the previous one. Um, so it's a tag that you can add to a draft uh, to link another RFC to a new RFC, an existing RFC to a new RFC. And then when this draft gets published as an RFC, also the, the already published RFC gets new metadata tag, tag saying it has been updated by so that people looking at the old RFC know that there's a newer RFC which has some additional information to it. And as I briefly said already, the problem is just like it's not, this, the meaning of this tag is not well defined. There's no RFC explaining what the meaning is or no official definition of it. Um, so the consequence of this was that it's used for very different purposes currently and that's really confusing because people don't know if they should use it or not and there's a lot of inconsistency in the, in the RFC series. So now you can go to the next slide. So what we have currently is that, for example, a lot of groups, they actually use the updates tag for something that they want to be mandatory to implement because it's something like a bug fix or something really important that needs to be added to an existing protocol. Other groups, for example, also use the update tag for things which are more optional extensions, which use existing ex extension points in a protocol or for version updates. Sometimes for, version, for new versions, updates uh, is used, sometimes not. So it's very inconsistent. And uh, and the main problem here and the main discussion we always have, does it, the, what does it mean for implementation? Is something that updates another document, or another RFC, mandatory to implement or like how should implementers see this and behave? Next slide. So what we propose in this draft is not to define the update stack because it's already used for all these different use cases. So like one single definition wouldn't help. Uh, what, we define, what we propose is to instead define three new tags. Um, so one would be amend, which is actually this mandatory to implement change to an RFC. So that's something that's more than an error, but it's still something like a bug fix or a change of behavior where the experience has shown this needs to be changed. Um, and here, like we have actually in the draft currently some normative language saying this must be implemented. We know that, of course, old implementations who are not aware of the new document will not like magically change, but at least somebody who is newly implementing a protocol should also implement or must also implement um, the updating RFC. The second tag is the extend tag. So that's an optional extension, something like using an existing extension point with a new option. Um, and here it's really, the purpose really is to really have a link from the base spec to these kind of extensions. So people who are implementing the base spec, they are aware that there are these kind of extensions that might become handy for their use case and that they might want to implement as well, but there's kind of no, no necessarily to implement it. And then the third tag we propose is a little bit the one for all these other cases um, or something which is also, which is called C also, which is really like if you read this RFC, this RFC might be interesting for you as well. And there are a couple of cases where this is really useful, especially for information RFCs. So it's really just adding a link to an existing RFC to a new, from new, to a new RFC. Next slide. I think there's someone in the queue who might have ah. a clarification question. Lennox. Um, I'm not sure it's a clarification or what, but I've, the, the situation that I've run into sometimes is a situation where you have a base spec that says must not do X, and then somebody writes an extension where, you know, it's may do X if negotiated. 
Um, so the argument was it's not just an extension because it's actually violating a must not in the base in the original spec, but obviously it's only if you negotiated it. So would that be extended or amended or something else? So um, I think that really depends on, you know, if you think this is like a mandatory to implement thing or not. Is it if you implement the base spec, is it mandatory to also implement this extension because otherwise it doesn't have the behavior you would like to see on the network today? Or is it really just like something that is optional for a certain use case? Generally, it's optional for a certain use case, but it's, you know, I think the example is, you know, like the, all the, the must be zero fields you have. You know, yeah, yeah, the, and I, I understand. Don't understand. Yeah, yeah. So if it's so, really if it's if it's meant as an as an existing extension point to a protocol, it should be extended. Yeah, um, yeah but I guess I guess, I guess the, you know you you know you might have a situation where the two endpoints it's optional, but if you have somebody in the middle is trying to do like you know protocol enforcement or whatever, then maybe it's not. So that's. So I think also this yeah. the the yeah I, I'm not sure if there's a direct correlation between use of normative language and use of these texts. I see a lot of people in the queue now. Okay. Also, Suresh was my co-author, <laughs> um, but maybe I should just go to the end of the presentation because I have too much lights and then take all the questions. Let's do that. I'm not sure Suresh is in the queue and he might want to add something to this specific point. So. Yeah, actually, uh, yes. I think uh, this is like more a signal, Jonathan, for like implementers. If they look at the original RFC at some later point in time, if we know of like breaking updates that like, we want them to implement, that's what the signal. So this like must be zero and middle box, um, like trying to enforce something is like um, not a problem. This is going to solve at all. But the idea is like, you know, you be, imagine we found some kind of bug in the original RFC and we fixed it. We don't want somebody uh, looking at the old RFC to not know about the existence of the new one. Thank you. Okay, but media, you can continue with the presentation and we take the questions at the end then. Thank you, that's perfect. Um, so what what um, does, what does what are the other things that the, RFC, uh, the draft says? Um, so it says like, if you use this, these texts, you should only, or you must only use them with a defined meaning um, in the draft. But of course, it's not mandatory to use the text, the text. So if the text, if you uh, write an extension, um, you can use those texts, but there's like no obligation to do so. Still, um, then as the same as with updates today, you know, it doesn't make any existing RFC invalid. As I explained already, you know, it's a mandatory to implement thing. But of course, if you have an existing implementation that's still compliant to the RFC that you implement, because you don't change the RFC. So this, this is the same with updates, and that also caused a lot of confusion. <laughs> it doesn't change anything here by using these more well-defined um, text. Um, of course, uh, or like this question came up uh, on some list: is text can only be referenced to RFCs and not to external resources. Understand that like having a reference to an external resource can be useful as well sometimes, but I think we need a different mechanism or a different tag for it maybe. So those texts here are only for reference in RFC. Um, then there is no restriction on the stages and maturity level between the RFC. So for example, you can have an information RFC that amends or extends a proposed standard RFC. Um, we, we have those cases in this year. Sometimes it makes sense. All I'm saying is that this document doesn't make any restrictions here. If any future restrictions are needed, then that should be a different, uh, different document or a different uh, topic. There are also no requirements on like how the an, an amendment should look like because you know all this new old style or old new style um, kind of notation or some RFCs who currently update other RFCs just use text. We don't set, do any requirements on this um, in this RFC. I think that's also a separate topic, and there is actually a separate RFC, uh, draft for this. And then we also, for the amends and for the extends uh, tag, we uh, follow or we recommend the same guidelines as we have for updates today, which says this should be um, mentioned in the abstract and in the introduction. Um, also, we provide further recommendations. Um, that you provide additional information about these RFCs um, that update or that are updated, no, that update another RFC. Um, this is not applicable to C also. C also is like very loosely and it's really just a link and you don't have to mention it much if you don't want to, but you may. Okay, final slide. 
Um, so we, as I said, this, this uh, came out of the ISG and some discussion we had on the ITF ad mailing list uh, based on this ISG statement or the proposed ISG statement. Um, we got some feedback that people think this is, uh, this is useful already, but uh, it's only a small number of people, so we definitely want more feedback before we move ahead here. So first question is really, do, do people think this is useful? Or at least do people think this is more useful than the current updates that we have? Um, then currently, uh, with a note in the draft that this should need further discussion, but currently the draft also um, states that with the um, publication of the draft, SRC, the update tag will be obsolete and should not or must not be used anymore. Um, our idea behind this was to avoid this confusion <laughs> that we have currently and really have a clear switch over. Um, but people have also raised opinions that they think it would be too early to deprecate updates and we still need it. Um, I would really like to see a, a sharp cut because otherwise it kind of blurs, blurs the usability or the the function of having clear definitions if you still have this very undefined tag there. Another open question was, um, do other streams want to adapt these tags as well, or are they useful for other streams? Currently, the um, RFC is only proposing this tag for the IETF stream, because you know this, we are an ITF group, we're discussing it here, and that's also where we got feedback so far, but we also talked to the other stream editors or stream managers and they were quite positive about it. So we could probably uh, extend it to all streams if people think that's a good idea. There's one point about updating eventually the RC style guide and the version three vocabulary. Um, that's just an, an open point. We need to decide what to do on it. And then uh, there was a little question about how well do these tags apply to process documents and we should figure out if they apply well or if there's something else that needs to be covered and give some examples how this can be done in the draft, which is also an open issue or open to do right now. And that's the end of my presentation now. Thank you, Mirja. So we have a lot of people in the queue, so I'll ask you to be brief. First one is JCK. Can you please state your name as well? Uh, John Clemson. Um, I, I, I admire the amount of effort and thinking that has gone into this, uh, but I'm very concerned that except for C also, each of these categories leads to hair splitting about marginal cases that may turn out to be more confusing than it's worth. And that in turn takes us down the path that we've tried to go down before with applicability statements, which actually provide explanations of what these things are about. And, uh, and the notorious new track effort, which attempted to sort these things out in a different way. I'm, I'm quite concerned that, uh, that if we do this as a substitute for those other things, we will just dig ourselves in deeper in spite of the fact, again, I think the, uh, the effort and thinking is very worthwhile and the idea ought to be good. Thanks. Thanks, John. Um, so I, I totally see your concern here. Um, I just would like to add that the same problem applies to the current situation where we're in. That we have a lot of hair splitting about, I mean, that's, that's the base problem we try to at least improve, that we have a lot of hair splitting about if updates should be used or not. And because every group and every person actually has their own definition about what update, update should be or should not be. And sometimes they're very patient about it and they really say, no, you can only use it in this case and I don't want to use it otherwise. And then yeah. I had very I had very long discussions with people going back and forth and so on and say it's not defined you can you don't have to right um, so my hope was at least having those new tags the situation could improve it might not improve it might stay as worse as it is but at least there's a chance for improvement I don't think it will get worse yeah well I'm I'm, I'm concerned about the possibility it could get worse as we try to as somebody tries to navigate through a large collection of documents yeah. and as I and as I told Sean in uh, in Jabber chat, the first person I heard complaining about uh, the lack of definition of the update tag of the updates tag was John Pastel. This has been a very long standing problem. Yeah, point taken. Thanks. Thanks, John. Next in queue is Spencer. Thank you. This is Spencer. Um, so, I, honestly, we've had so many different ways of uh, verifying. Of, of using updates, um, I'm almost ready to suggest uh, 
deprecating that now. Um, I, would it make more sense if this if we deprecated updates and even all other tags as well in RFC text and move this all to metadata? I'm not sure I understand your question, but these texts are metadata. Um, uh, just like one clarification there, Spencer, and this is like a thing, uh, sorry, the Suresh Krishna. Uh, one of the things that we kind of, like we thought these as and as tags and other time as like metadata, but there's like a significant difference that um, I think Brian Carpenter brought up in like one of the discussions we had over email. The updates is actually part of the RFC. It's actually yes, a, a, a immutable I mean. yes. part. Right. It's an immutable part yes, of the RFC, exactly. but the up updated is not. Updated is a metadata tag. So I think um, um, the rendering of the metadata can be separate, but like one of the one of each of these tags is going to be an immutable text of the RFC, mm -hmm. and the other one is going to go into some other RFC as metadata. Yeah, so, actually, that's that's true, and it also does make sense because usually in the in the um, in the draft or then RFC that updates another RFC, you also are supposed to mention in the abstract and introduction um, why you update this document and like this information is inherent in the RFC, right? It's not something you can rip off the RFC anyway. Yeah, no, I'm I'm just asking about the about the linkage, but it seems like to me that I mean the other thing is we've got so many people that are in queue that are former area directors uh, who have had conversations about this. Um, while they were on the ISG, um, you know, just the amount of time that we saved for, for the ISG would be worth doing this. But I, I really wonder if it's time for us to stop putting stuff in immutable RFCs that's not going, you know, that's not going to be complete. And you know, things, thing, you know, things like updates, you know, um, th things like updates and things like that. Well, or uh, you know. It's like you're going to you're going to have to use the tools that produce the met, that show you the metadata, not just the RFC text, in order to figure out what's going on anyway. And uh, we're not I know we're not talking about errata, but we've had those conversations also. Um, so you know, it's like I, I'm definitely open for a better solution. I don't have one. <laughs> no, no, no. I think I, I I I think this I think this is I think this is an improvement over. The way we've done updates in the past, you know, yeah. and and so and and like every time we try to touch updates, it's like, well, you know, but it doesn't work for RFC nine or something that's you know, um, all, all the you know that's all the way back, and so no, we never did anything. So th this is this is an improvement. It's changing. It's changing the. Um, it's changing the vocabulary that we're arguing about, instead of arguing about the same vocabulary, which which is an improvement. And I, like I say, I wonder if you know focusing this stuff is all going to be metadata. We're not going to put it in the text of the RCs, and you're really going to need to use the tools that show you the metadata to get a really clear picture of what's going on. Because if you're just looking at the RC text, you're not getting that anyway. Thank you. Thank you. The next thank you is Mohit. Uh, hi, this is Mohit. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. So I, I will try to be brief because we are short on time. I had three three points and you can listen to them and maybe then either keep them for a future update or, or answer now. It's up to you. So one thing uh, from your presentation and also from the draft which I thought could benefit a bit more is to explain the relationship between amended by and obsoleted by. I'm sure there is a difference but perhaps like explicitly stating What's the difference between obsoleted by and amended by would help me. Uh, my sec second comment was uh, about C also. Uh, I am a bit worried that it may lead to like all kinds of misuse. So of course I have an academic background and I want everyone to cite my papers and look at my protocols. So I'm thinking like uh, if I go and like uh, ask the IESG that Sometimes we have competing protocols, and if I want that, hey, my competitor's protocol should also have C also, and then uh, people should be re redirected to me or uh, or to to my protocol. And to give a concrete example, I think Suresh has been AD on one of uh, my drafts on this. 
address protected neighbor discovery, which is basically IoT version of neighbor discovery. And should I go and say, see also on basically neighbor discovery for IPv6 on every draft? I'm not sure. And my third comment was, uh, which I'm still not certain if the IESG has thought about, is uh, cyclical kind of updates. So uh, this, again, using the example of uh, address protected neighbor discovery, uh, is updating RFC 8505, which updates RFC 6775. So in this case, like, should it update both or should it update only the latest one and how this would then move when you have like even more tags, uh, like amended by, uh, do you carry over these things is, is something that I could benefit from some clarification. So those were my comments. Feel free to answer them now or like take them later on. Uh, Media, do you want me to take this? I can uh, give sure. a quick answer. Uh, so for the obsoleted by, there's like a big difference, right? Like obsoleted means the old document is like no longer in use, don't use it, like it's dead, right? And the amended by means like, you know, the old one is still good, but there's some changes that are required. It's the same relationship between uh, obsoleted by and updated by today, right? The old one is whether it's still valid or not, right? The there is actually one. an ISG statement uh, clarifying that, which we probably should change if we update, if we publish this document, yes. Right, right. For the second one, for the C also, obviously there's like quite a bit of like, you know, uh, these things are going to go on. And uh, I think it's like one of the, we threw this up because like people did want like a lightweight way of referencing things. Uh, there's going to be gatekeeping on this, right? This is not really uh, something that people can throw willy nilly. Like you, you still have to go through the chairs of the working group and the IESG and they'll say like, oh, why are you doing this? So there's some kind of back pressure. And for the last thing, the update, uh, uh, I don't call it cyclical, but it's recursive, right? You know, you could, uh, document A could update B and B could be uh, like, you know, updating. Yeah, that, C, that's right? better. That's, recursive is the right term, sorry. Right. Yeah, so I think uh, that's already there too. So that's like, so we're trying to keep things like at least as good as they are. Like when we go for other than like the stuff John brought up, right? This is not bringing up any new failure cases. That's kind of the uh, answer. So your, your points stand, but it's like no, no different than today. Yeah, that's true. And, and there, I mean, there is a risk that uh, you see more of more use of C also than we see of today update today. But that might also be good, right? Because sometimes update is not used today where it would be useful. And at least for um, IETF stream documents, uh, we have in the ISG a lot of comments on our reviews saying, shouldn't this update something or this should maybe not update? So there is like somebody who, who does another check on this. Uh, just consider the overhead uh, on my, IESG. Sorry. My, yeah. my yeah. No, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm done. I'm done. Yes. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. We have a lot of people and not a lot of time. So please really try to uh, shorten um, your comment. Now is Mark. Uh, Mark Nottingham. Uh, I'll, I'll try. Um, I have comments in roughly three areas. Could you go back to the slide that proposes the different tags? Lovely, thank you. Um, so, uh, first of all, it's, it's really hard to, to comment about this without data. Um, I know we have a lot of anecdotal experience, but my understanding was that from, from Jabber conversation that Shresh had done a survey, and I know it's a, a subjective judgment, but some data about how we use updates would really inform this decision. So I'm a little disappointed not to see that in the presentation. Um, but, but just going off of this, you know, Amends and amended by seems like kind of what most people think of updates. So if, if we need a new term, that would be appropriate. It's not clear we need a new term though. We need, like I said, we need to see the data. Extends and extended by, um, I thought this is why we had registries. Um, if, if everything that registers something now needs to say what it extends up in the header, we're going to have pretty busy headers. And, and likewise, see also, um, I thought that's why we had references. If, if we need to now have references up in the header as well. That, that's going to be pretty busy. Um, but stepping back in my third and I, I think last comment for now, you know, as far as I'm aware, you know, all the different countries in the world with statutory law systems, that's common law or so all have the statutory law set out in a way where it's updated in, in place. And so you look and you can see the latest version of the legislation integrated with all of the amendments. Um, for some reason, we don't do that. 
I don't know why, but this kind of feels like a Band-Aid uh, more than anything. And I, I'd rather get at the real disease rather than just sticking a Band-Aid on it. Um, so two points. I think on your first part, you illustrated very well the problem because you said you are really sure that the way we use updates today is immense. And that's not what everybody is sharing because there's no definition for it. And that's the whole problem that some people think updates is used for extends. Some people think it can only be used for it. Show me the data, please. Use it in it. I'd like I mean, to see we the data. Did, uh, we did look at it and it's really hard to, to um, uh, I mean, like it's used a lot. It's really hard to um, cluster um, this because there are so, so many different use cases. And the, the bigger problem is, as I said, the hours I spent with authors trying to explain that actually there is no real definition. You can use it or like the whole ISG does because it comes over and over again frequently in our reviews. Um, on your second point, I think that's a that would be really nice. But I think that's a separate thing. That's either a separate procedure or maybe it's just a tooling question. But I don't think uh, it's the, the exact same topic. Yeah, um, uh, Mark, uh, one thing is like, yeah, I did spend some time on it. I'll see if I can put some kind of like statistics together. It's it's not like it's a bit fuzzy. Like, you know, I kind of do this like loss causes thing. I do go look at like a lot of RFCs, but I'll see if I can come up with some kind of summary. But uh, it's not not even like close to majority of the things being amends, right? Like, you know, people use it for like all kind of things. And that's like one thing. And for the C also being references, the, the issue is like, uh, you cannot add references into an RFC that's been published. So I, I, I'm fully with you. Like uh, I, I would really like uh, to go where we update things in place. Like I'm, I'm, I'm like I count my word in for it. Like I, so if that's something we're gonna do, like I would say like you know let's kill this right. But until then, um, I, I would like to keep this at least like going to see if we can get something better than today on the updates uh, stuff. So I think we need to cut the queue here because we are already um, going on the, for the presentation time. Um, so there was a question that was, uh, what's the mailing list to openly discuss this work? I think it's an important question. Ah, um, yeah, so currently we sent some uh, requests for feedback on the um, RC interest. RC mailing interest, list. yeah. Yeah, so I think that's the right place. So uh, that I mean that does bring us to the real dispatch question is this are are you looking to just have this conversation in RFC dispatch and you'll figure out what to do there or um, RFC interest yes uh, sorry. <laughs> um yeah so I mean I think I think we're at the stage where we really need more input um we got a few people saying that they think this is useful we didn't get like too many uh, or like we didn't get only very few um concerns but nobody saying this is like really bad please don't do it um but we don't need more and more input um you and may have then, not gotten many concerns because we were back in the queue no i'm um, like for the for the feedback that we got that up to now <laughs> like well, if you, you if you have some concerns Maria. yeah like if you haven't been able to uh say something in the queue you can still discuss this document on the RFC interest mechanism and we will listen to you. It's not moving on right now. That's what I'm saying. We need more input. Um, and, and, and I guess, you know, I, I mean, are, are you happy just continuing to get feedback on this on RFC interest? You don't need a working group and you're just going to keep this as an a individual submission that somebody on the IASD will eventually sponsor? Or yeah, I think that would be appropriate because it's a short document. Are, are is everyone else okay with that or are there folks who want to stand up and say this needs a working group or uh, something else along those lines so there is uh ecker in the queue or sorry robert first so i think that continued conversation on rfc interest is a good start i would hate to see the isg try to act on this without having it go through something that looks like a working group. I think if we're going to make this change, we need to have the fight in the community, not in the ISG, and build some guidance that will keep these arguments um, out of the ISG in the future. Noted. Ecker? Yeah. Um, Eric Scrolla, yeah. Um, regardless of the, the, the substantive points, yeah, I think that, like, um, you know, the point of this process here is to get feedback from the community. And so 
the um this can happen i guess you have a discussion rfc interest but like before this gets 80 sponsored this should go back through some process like like den dispatch or a working group it shouldn't just be like go from rfc interest right to like 80 sponsor okay ben this is ben kaduk i would also be moderately uncomfortable with taking this straight from rfc interest discussion to 80 sponsored thank you i also want to report that a lot of uh uh, working group plus one on working group in the Jabber and Alisa. Alyssa Cooper, I think if that's the direction people go in, then I, I would really like to see the discussion focus on the substance of the proposal and not like sort of switch to charter text. So I just wanted to note that, like, I think we should continue to discuss the problem and then see what comes of it and not have people think about like, what is the shape of this working group? So it, are I, uh, maybe maybe we don't have time to answer that, but but I do have a question because like I understand that there are a lot of problems which are related to this point, uh, which people might want to work on, but there are also some of these problems are much harder to solve than this one. Um, so I'm not I'm not entirely sure when people say they want a working group, like what what they have in mind about this, but that's probably also something we can discuss. A point. Alyssa, um, is your inclination for this to set up another mailing list and get discussion started there or stick to RFC interest for the moment? From my perspective, RFC interest is fine. Yeah, I just wanted to propose to stick there for the moment for the discussion and then I come back to Jen Dispatch next time. And see if it, w what form it's going to take to get forward. Yep. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. That makes sense. Like, and and actually, uh, sort of Krishna. So, like, there's like a bigger problem too, right? Like, you know, we started off this being an IETF stream only application stuff, and we had to expand this to other streams. Like, we probably need to find a bigger community to get input from. So, I do agree with Ecker, and that we do need to collect input from a larger community. Like, the actual form, I'm okay with, but we probably have a bigger community than just the IETF. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, but that sounds like a plan. I think we can, sorry, someone is not muted. Chi Jun Su. I think we can move to the next presentation. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you, Miria. Get this full screen. Next person, okay. maybe not. So I would say let's keep the the um, discussion at the end of the presentation, Brian. If you can be as short as possible, that will help. And um, I'm going to open the queue right away. Okay. Can you hear me? Just fine. Okay. Um, so this is not really a, a bit of a straw man. It only came into existence a week or two ago. Uh, in the light of current events, and uh, therefore I don't think we can have a detailed debate on a straw man in this particular meeting, but just to warn you that it's changing more or less as I speak. Um, next slide then. So the problem statement, context and motivation in one slide, we're seeing increased remote participation, we're seeing now the probability of less frequent meetings, and this year for a well understood reason and in the longer term because of people worrying about sustainability and so on. So it seems to quite a few people that the current criterion for non-com eligibility is no longer fair because it's based basically on paying to spend a week at the IETF uh, three times a year. Um, the cancellation of IETF 107 has added some urgently, has some urgency, and I personally feel we need to be ready in case ITF 108 is also affected, which means that we're talking about the criteria for uh, the 2020 to 2021 volunteer pool. Uh, it's clearly too late to do much for this year. So next slide, please. So. What this 
that proposal suggests is, well, as written at the moment, uh, an update to RFC 8713, which is a BCP. A uh, suggestion that came up uh, earlier today is that it could be done as a process experiment, because there is a BCP that allows the ITF to conduct process experiments, which would mean it would be an experimental RFC. Uh, another option is to make it an update um, with a time limit, say, would it be uh, applied for two years, which would put some pressure on the ITF to decide what it wanted for a real long-term solution. Anyway, the basic idea is to add new measurable criteria for non-com eligibility. Measurable means that the Secretariat can run a script um, from existing data and find out who would be eligible. Uh, no judgment calls involved by the Secretariat or anyone else. The suggested additional criteria that get added to a meeting attendance, uh, recent service as a working group chair or working group secretary, recent active draft reviewing in one of the official review teams, recent service in, various, in I-star roles that would clearly not allow current members to be eligible for the non-com, because they're not, but people who have been in the I-star IB, IESG, et cetera, in the last few years. And a recent authorship of ITF stream documents, that's to say RFCs that have gone through the ISG approval process. Um, so there's a few more details in the text, but that's the outline. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there are some non-deliverables not talked about in this draft as feasible in the short term because we want to do something quickly. Combining criteria to allow for someone to partially satisfy several of the criteria, some sort of time decay in the metrics so that recent participation is more highly valued. A complicated question of whether we allow all 12 voting members of the OMCOM to uh, to be qualified by the same criteria, or whether we have more complexity in that. And a sort of bit of a tricky question, which has already been discussed elsewhere, should we separate the non-com volunteer criteria from the recall petitioner criteria? Uh, because that's a case where remote participants are currently definitely feeling disadvantaged. And um, that question maybe needs to be addressed. Now, thing we do not consider in this draft at all are criteria for volunteers that require any subjective judgment. Um, I think that is, to my mind, unavoidable. There may be people who disagree, but I don't see how we could ever have a practical system where the Secretariat produces the list of qualified people if there's any kind of judgment call involved. So that's the sort of summary of what's in the document. Um, next slide, please. So the author's feeling is we should continue the discussion on the eligibility discuss list. Um, and our feeling is that there is some urgency to get this done because of being ready for the following year's non-com cycle. So our suggestion is to look for AD sponsorship for this um, with the rider, which is not on the document, that we should put a, a time limit on it in some way or other, because this is a fairly important topic and definitely a permanent change would clearly need uh, a proper IETF consensus, not not just a four-week last call. So I think uh, you can take that as missing in the current draft some sort of time limit to avoid the problem of committing ourselves forever to what might, might or might not be a successful solution to a relatively short-term crisis. 
So that's it. I will uh, see what people have to say. Okay. Uh, first in queue is Ted. Ted, go ahead. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, so I have a couple of questions. Um, first of all, uh, so the, the, this is like an urgent uh, uh, plan that needs to happen before ITF 108, which is in July. So that's like really, really short notice. Um, so my question is, does this actually make a difference? Like, like, is there somebody who uh, would be eligible for uh, NOMCOM in 2020 because of this document who isn't currently eligible for NOMCOM? Like, like what's the actual, uh, what's the actual change that, that, that creates the urgency to get this done so quickly? As Brian, my comment is that, you know, if we lose two meetings, then uh, we've pushed the time window for the three out of the last five, you know, back by eight months. If we, if we, let's hope it doesn't happen. But if we lost three meetings, we'd have pushed it back by a full year. So it makes the uh, the eligibility criterion progressively staler. And I right. personally don't like that. Yeah, I, I agree with that. But the problem, the problem is that, um, that what you're doing doesn't actually. I don't think actually fixes that because the people who are already in the eligibility pool are the same people who would remain in the eligibility pool as a result of uh, the, the new criteria that you've added. I don't think you're actually going to change the size of the eligibility pool materially by doing this. Uh, uh, and, and so, go ahead. I, you know, I don't know that until someone writes the script and runs it and then we can actually look at the numbers. Yeah. Well, maybe that's worth doing. Okay, next thing in queue is Bron. Uh, I oh, have sorry. one other question. We're done. Sorry. Hey, this is Bron Gondwana. Um, I just wanted to mention the 100 point check which Australia uses for ID, which has primary documents and less important things. And I think that's a good model for this that turning up to meetings is still the primary thing and is worth more points towards being eligible. Um, I've posted a link in Jabba. Yeah, it sounds like Canadian immigration as well. And I think New Zealand's moving to the points based immigration too. So yeah, it's it's a thought. Sorry, Ted, I thought you were done. Uh, go ahead. Oh, oh. I, I can't hear you, Ted. Ted shows is muted. Sorry. Uh, how about now? <laughs> no, it's good. Um, yeah, the, the, I'm mute, the WebEx app is a little bit challenging to use on the iPad. Anyway, the question, the other question I had is that if if reviewing documents makes one eligible, so presumably that means reviewing documents that are not currently RFCs. Uh, does that mean that working on a working group document also makes one eligible? I didn't see that in the version of the document that I looked at, uh, but I may have missed it. That's an open question to me. Um, we, it is a an open question. Should we count working group uh, official working group drafts as as criteria as a criteria? Um, okay, you know. right. Thanks. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Next in queue is Spencer. Yeah, um, we I think we started down this road, but just to make sure we get all the way there, if we don't meet a person for 107, 108, 109. We're either running with um, we're either running with very stale criteria, or we're running with this criteria because we stopped using this. You know, because nobody's eligible under the current criteria. Uh, is that is that roughly true? Uh, eventually, that will become true. Yes, but uh, you know, my hope is that doesn't happen. Uh, yeah, I, I direct you to my uh, lieutenant governor, but that's another story. Uh, so I'm plus one for a process experiment, you know, RC 3933 process experiment on this, uh, which I since since that does not require updating the uh, the the process RFCs until the ISG thinks the the experiment has succeeded. 
uh, that would be that might be a good way to get started. Uh, but like I say, I, this is a move. This is a really serious moving target. I like the way this is headed. I like the way that we're talking about uh, doing real. Uh, you know, who is doing productive work uh, to to have a, to have a uh, to have an opinion? Uh, so there are things I like about this, but uh, you know I think we're into the do something quick and then uh, and then uh, see whether we've done enough and whether we need to do more uh, state. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next in queue is Colin. So I, I agree with need to do I apologize, I agree we need to do something here. I, I, I get that. I, I don't think it's quite as urgent as some people think. But I'm not in favor of this because I think that many of these suggestions here will greatly warp what we're doing other things. There'll be all kinds of pressure to put people's names on drafts so they become eligible. There'll be pressure to add people as secretaries that do nothing. We already have people that have been on review committees forever that write useless reviews. I mean, I just I think this will actually harm our work, so I don't think that these measures are the right ones. I think we need to find a better way. Thanks. Um, so this is Brian. Suggestions are very welcome, Colin, but uh, you know everything can be gamed. That's one of the problems in this business. I, 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 I well taken. I understand. Lots of plus one to Colin in the in the jobber as well. Uh, next in queue is Lucy. This is uh, Lucy Lynch. Can you hear me? We can. Brian, a couple of reminders. The NOMCOM chair is also subject to these criteria. So factor that in when you're writing. Mm -hmm. Also, to follow up on Cullen's point, the people that you're talking about are the most productive and the most committed by their employers. And there's already been difficulty recruiting among that pool. If you refine the pool down to just those people, you will have a harder time finding an yeah. eligibility list that actually can stand. Uh, that's correct. But uh, I mean, the first thing we say is the meeting attendance criteria and doesn't change, that will still get you in. But uh, the idea was to add, not subtract. Yeah. Um, and one final point um, in the next round. When you're looking at remote participation, you're going to want to change the criteria for in-person interviews to either all remote or only in-person. My experience is that half remote and half in-person biases the selection. Yeah, I agree, but that's out of scope for this particular document, but I agree with you. Okay, uh, next in queue is Martin. Yeah, so I was going to say um, a lot of what Cullen said, but uh, I think one thing to remember here is what what we're going to get is what what, what we measure is what we'll get, and uh, Cullen's right to point out some of the negative effects of that. Um, I wanted to uh, emphasize the point that Cullen made kind of offhand, which is the urgency around this. I think we're in exceptional circumstances. Um, it may be a good reason for us to re-examine what it is that we consider cri uh, eligibility criteria, but it doesn't mean that we need to rush anything. I don't think there's any particular urgency uh, around this, and I certainly would be opposed to, to getting AD sponsorship for something like this on very short timescales. Well, we heard you. Okay, um, last comment is for Les. But I'm, I'm still not sure that I understand the answers to the two questions that are in my mind, right? So the first one is, if we don't do anything, would basically for something like NOMCOM um, the last three actually happening physical ITFs be used in terms of 107 would be ignored? Is that you know, um, how the process would continue right now. And the second one is, if the first question is yes, then, you know, do we have evidence that there are new people that would have become, you know, eligible through 107? Thank you. Well, the second question is easy. I don't, I don't have any idea. <laughs> Maybe next week we could find out. Uh, the first question, I think, we, you know, I'm not a lawyer that it seems to me that the only way to interpret the BCP 
is to use three out of the last five meetings that actually happened uh, with people in the room. So I think what would happen is that if, you know the the volunteer pool would just get staler and staler and staler in the more meetings that were cancelled. Right, but it would become more and more urgent the more we have, right? So towards 108, it Correct. wouldn't be that important. But yeah, if, if we get the answer to these two questions, what would I, IESG do now without yeah. additional work? And then really, how bad does the pool already stay in one step? I think that would help to take yeah. that. Well, it's a reasonable question to ask the IESG, but I, um, you know, I'm not quite sure how they can answer it, except by saying, well, you know, we have to follow the DCP. Okay, so um, as it says on the slide, continue discussion on the eligibility discuss list. I think, Stephen, do you have any comment? Uh, if my audio works, I do. Uh, yes, it does. So, uh, yeah, I think we've got some pretty concrete feedback to make another rev of the draft, I think. Uh, I do think we should fix this. Uh, I think we should fix it as, as properly. We should actually do it. I mean, the, the danger of people saying this is not urgent until next year is that nothing will ever happen. Um, I think that's a significant danger, probably a bigger danger than that we do something imperfect, in fact. Um, and we should not forget in anything we do that the current situation is already unfair to lots of people, and some of whom, not all of whom, but some of whom are, are actually good participants in the IGF. Alisa, go ahead. I, I, Alyssa Cooper, I have a question on this uh, debate about the urgency. I just want to make sure that I understand. Are people concerned that if the criteria aren't set for uh, a, a time frame that allows people to become eligible, that that is a problem? I.e., let's say one of the criteria is um, uh, you know, authorship of an RFC, that if you don't know that that uh, is a criteria, one of the criteria, until two months before the, the call is set to go out for volunteers, that you, you didn't have an opportunity to author an RFC in that time? Are people <laughs> concerned about that in terms of the urgency? Or it's just like the con what Stephen just stated, which is just that if we don't actually act, then, you know, things tend to take a long time in the ITF. Uh, that's correct. Uh, I, I think it's the second case that you know, if we if we make this a typical ITF process working group discussion, it will take a long time, and you know that, and I know it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So what I've heard, and I haven't been able to uh, keep up with the chat, so maybe Pete, you can help me uh, here. Chat is fast and furious, and I'm not sure I can help that much. Okay. <laughs> um, I am. Th there's been a lot in the chat that I've read about that it's not as urgent as perhaps we think because we're using a non com relatively shortly, and then nothing happens for another year that we have to worry about this, um, so that we can back fix this. That said, we probably need something to deal with the interim case and at least collect the data. Um, but as far as the dispatch question of where this goes, um, there any objection to keeping this on the eligibility list and um, making a call relatively quickly about what needs to happen in the short term? Not seeing anyone jump into the uh, Spencer. Spencer. Some yeah. people agree. Yeah. Well, uh, and I was just going to say, yeah, yes, uh, we, we, we the jabber is just afloat with things that are not in scope for this draft. So I think that keeping this draft on eligibility is a brilliant plan. Uh, coming up with places to discuss all the other stuff would be equally brilliant but uh, but uh, that like I say that that's that's why I'm think that's why I'm thinking putting this is on the eligibility discuss list or keeping it there is a good plan thank you 
Barry. Barry Lieben. The um, I'm making a decision quickly for this nomcom. The conversation that's happening on the yeah, main list. I, I meant to post a deadline for making comments at the end of April, and we will. The ISG will determine the consensus is from that discussion. What happens immediately for this? Nomcom. Brian, please mute. Brian. So please, if you have not already weighed in on that on, on that thread on IETF at IETF.org, please do. And I'll post something to, to pop that to the top and, and give a deadline of April 30th. Okay, we are officially over time. So what I've heard is more discussion. Uh, um, Yeah, and possibly um, coming back to Gen Dispatch then. Well, and sorry, the, the, the question I raised, is that, that a fair question to ask the IESG? I'm sorry, who was that? That was Solis, right? So Brian said it's a fair question to ask the ISG how they would read the current BCP. Because they seemingly need to make the decisions for NOMCOM, right? That's likely true. So how would they read it? Would they ignore 107? Well, I think given where we are in time, I think that conversation could be had either on eligibility to discuss or uh, tossed directly to the IESG on the uh, IETF list. Well, uh, this is Barry. Oh. That's what I just said. Um, that that the discussion of what to do right now for this nomcom with respect to 107 is being had on IETF at IETF.org. We 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 we're going to set a deadline of the end of April for comments on that, and we'll just decide what the consensus is. So uh, this is a this is Alyssa. I'm sorry, Alyssa Cooper. Uh, I just want a point of clarification because Francesca, um, you just said coming back to Gen Dispatch, but I, uh, my understanding was discussion on eligibility discuss, and then assuming that, you know, reaches some sort of conclusion, uh, AD sponsored. Am I incorrect in my understanding of what people were wanting here? I might have missed some comments or, yeah. Oh. Yes, Brian, that, that's what we suggested, but not everybody agrees. Yeah. Yeah, there, so, there's definitely disagreement about AD sponsoring it. Um, and I think probably um, we, we can have further discussion uh, if you want to have it on Gen Dispatch, but I think it's fine to do it on eligibility to discuss about how to go forward with this draft if this draft, draft needs to go forward right quick. Um, you know, there is always the option to spin up one of these very fast working groups uh, if we need to deal with a short-term problem. Got it. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all for spending an extra four minutes and losing four minutes of running to the kitchen to get a cookie before the plenary. Or and thank you for your here. patience. <laughs> And, and we will talk to you all soon. Thank you all. Thank you.